All right, so let's get going. So I'm going to talk a little bit in general about integrative oncology. Um, and I'm going to touch on a couple controversies that personally make me crazy because I consistently hear them, even though there's plenty of research sort of saying that they're actually not controversial. So we'll talk about that. And then I'll do what I was assigned to do, which was talk about um, specifically the symptoms of cancer-related fatigue, chemo brain, um, neuropathy, and then some menopausal symptoms, um, hot flashes, and sexual dysfunction. And I'm going to do that with a little bit of a presumption in my head that the people who are interested in that are people who aren't eligible for hormone replacement therapy, but obviously things cross over, and we'll talk about that too. So what's integrative oncology? Um, you guys can read the definitions, but to me what it, what it basically means is taking care of whole person. And I love this description that comes from the Society for Integrative Oncologists. The integrative oncologists strive to support innate healing abilities of the individual utilizing techniques for self-empowerment, individual responsibility, and lifestyle change that could improve cancer outcomes and quality of life. And I think about, you know, FORCE and the group and Sue Friedman and all the great people in different parts of the um, spectrum that are involved in this, and I think that's sort of like a perfect fit, like FORCE's integrative patient advocacy. Um, because it's sort of thinking about all those things. Oftentimes, I kind of come to stress and stress management last in my talk, but I was thinking you guys are kind of nearing the end of the conference. It might be better to talk about this early in the talk. So there's all of this data that stress management and social support improve cancer outcomes. And for a long time, we didn't really understand why it was. And one of the really interesting things to me about stress, when I talk about stress, is people will say, well, I'm not stressed. You know, I'm not really stressed. I'm fine. I'm okay. And I'll be, I'm not stressed either, but when we talk about stress in this way and when we talk about stress management, I actually want to think about stress as physical stress, right? So our body, how it responds to stressors. So to me, the best example of this, us not being aware of physical stress is driving. Tons of research indicates that if we check our cortisol levels and our norepinephrine and adrenaline and all those levels, five minutes into driving. As a matter of fact, even when you open the door and get, sit down in your car, um, all those hormones turn on. Now, why do they do that? It's a good thing, right? Because when we're driving, we are doing something technically life-threatening. We need to have like quickened reflexes and be able to pay attention to multiple things so that cortisol and everything turns on so it's an appropriate stress response. The tricky thing for us nowadays is we exist in that. They say anthropologically we were supposed to spend something like 70% of our waking hours with our sympathetic, with our parasympathetic nervous system on, our healing nervous system, and only about 20 to 30 with our sympathetic nervous system. And in modern society, we kind of do the opposite. And I think we're so used to doing the opposite that we actually like all those things that turn on our sympathetic nervous system, like caffeine, like coffee, like all the things we do for fun, like you know, IMAX movies, and you know, right now I'm like watching all of those true detectives and all those other things that kind of turn that on. So there's lots of evidence that says those hormones likely um, contribute to cancer and cancer risk. And why do they do that? We think they do that because the concept is if we were turned on our sympathetic nervous system and we were running through a forest and we were getting chased by a saber-toothed tiger, we might get cut, we might get hurt, we would need the ability to um, grow new blood vessels, to do those kinds of things. And so all our growth factors get turned on. Now we know there's interactions of all those growth factors and other things with things like our genes and environment that might increase our risk. And so there's lots of interesting data, and lots of it comes from ovarian cancer, that actually says those specific hormones, adrenaline, um, norepinephrine, and cortisol, increase the chance of metastasis and increase um, the ability of cancer cells to go and grow other places. So that's all scary, right? <laughs> What's the good news? Turning on our parasympathetic nervous system, or the healing half of our nervous system, is actually very easy. And we do it very intuitively. Just like if you have a kid who's kind of like out of control and we stop them and we say, listen, take a deep breath. We are turning down their cortisol and turning down their adrenaline. 
When we simply breathe out longer than we breathe in, it's like an automatic sign to our brain that we are not being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, and we can turn on all those healing mechanisms. Prayer, spiritual activities, laughter, for some people creative activities. There's more uh, deliberate ways to go about it, things like meditation, biofeedback, hypnosis, guided imagery, what I would consider all those things that fall under that mind, body, medicine category. And I think, you know, describing, you know, there's plenty of seats up front, ladies. Don't be shy and don't stand the whole time. Feel free to come work your way in. I don't feel interrupted. You, and if you want to stand back there to leave, no problem. But I just don't want you guys to feel like you have to stand back there. Um, because I started talking right away. I know you guys' lunch went over. So mind-body medicine, I mean, it's kind of funny that we even say it, right? Like inherently the mind is connected to the body. We could you know, indulge ourselves in a little activity where I could just stand up here and I could talk louder and faster and all of you guys would increase your blood pressure, right? All those things would happen. That's mind-body medicine. And we could talk ourselves into it or out of it, so to speak. Um, lots of data out there on hypnotherapy, on mindfulness-based meditation. And just looking at things like somebody who describes themselves as um, having spiritual well-being and look at the other correlates of it and see improved cancer-related outcomes. And I think of all of this as part of managing symptoms, the symptoms of cancer and then the symptoms and side effects of cancer treatment. This is one of my favorite studies. Um, a group of uh, 60 women with breast cancer who had completed their initial therapy, although a lot of them were still on anti-hormone therapy, um, underwent a study where they were randomized to one of three groups. They either didn't do anything or they were told to journal, and they were told to journal an hour a day uh, for five days a week, um, just for a week. On average, and then there was a third group, they were also told to journal, but they were very specifically directed to journal um, about their negative thoughts and negative feelings. And um, turned out they only journaled about 15 to 30 minutes a day for four days, but think about that as two hours of time. And from that two hours of time, the people who had the most benefits were the people who wrote about the negative things and the traumatic things, and amazing benefits. So they had decreased cancer-related medical visits, um, fewer side effects, fewer symptoms, improved sleep, improved energy, and there's this thing that we call performance status in the medical world that basically is a description of your ability to do your usual stuff. And so they had improvements in their performance status. And these benefits lasted for four to eight months, although they only did literally two hours of writing over a four-day period of time. So that, I'm going to switch gears a little bit to talking about diet and supplements. And when I do these kinds of activities, it seems like this is the thing that people are most interested in. And what people are most interested in are supplements. But I just want to sort of remind ourselves that, like, that pills and powders thing, it cannot make up for what we eat. So kind of the whole food piece of diet is about 30 million times more important than what you could put in a pill and take in the beginning of the day with a glass of water. Now, that said, I think there's lots of potential um, places that we can use concentrated forms of supplements and herbs, and so we'll talk a little bit about those too. Um, but the lesson, c I think, comes from vitamins. So there are people in this room who are as old as me or older and remember when beta carotene was like the magic bullet, right? It was going to like eliminate cancer from the face of the earth. And why we thought that was because all these epidemiologic studies that looked at it showed us that populations and people who ate more fruits and vegetables had substantially lower rates of getting cancer. So we did these studies. Now, when we do studies, we make certain decisions about how to do a study. Doing prevention studies is really hard because it means you have to intervene today and you have to follow people for like 30 to 40 years while they're at risk for cancer. And that's expensive. And then fortunately, cancer is a rare outcome. So you could put 10,000 people in your study and it may not be for years and a significant portion of them really weren't at risk for cancer. And so again, expensive. So how do we do this study? Well, we choose a high risk group of people, smokers and people exposed to asbestos, and then 
we don't really trust people, right? We don't really trust that they're going to get enough beta carotene or be good at writing down what they had. And the truth is we aren't very good. I barely remember what I ate yesterday. So like that whole diet diary thing. So we decided to put it in a pill. And when we put it in a pill, the scientists who were doing this study thought about, well, you know, beta carotene is not actually active vitamin A. It's pre-vitamin A. So let's put some activated vitamin A in there. Now, vitamin A and beta carotene are what we call um, differentiating agents, same as vitamin D, which means that if our cells are developing, they're one of the little tools that help those cells decide what path to walk, what kind of cell to become. That's why you can't use retinol products if you're trying to get pregnant or pregnant. That's why we see birth defects with that, right? Because that vitamin A is influencing the path those cells walk. So it makes sense to us, on the one hand, that we'd see prevention, but it also makes sense to us that we might see other side effects at higher doses. And in the studies that were done, we saw that we increased the rates of cancer substantially in smokers, in the smokers and in um, these men who are exposed to asbestos. So what, you know, do carrots cause cancer? Carrots do not cause cancer. What happened in our study? Maybe lots of little steps happened wrong, right? Maybe people who are smokers and exposed to asbestos have different kinds of precancers that might be differentially affected by vitamin A. And maybe if we took activated vitamin A and didn't give our body the chance to make the decisions about when it wanted to activate the beta carotene or not, maybe we changed how it influenced things. So lots of pieces of that might have been off. And the other part of it is I think of it like the problem with reductionism. Can you put an apple in a capsule? And the, and the answer to that is no, you can't. And maybe there's interactions between the cellulose and the fiber and everything else in that carrot. And maybe there's interaction between like how we eat things and how we prepare things that change that outcome. So as we're going to move on and talk about herbs and supplements, I just want us to have in the back of our mind this idea that the best place to get all these phytonutrients is in the whole food form. And I really love this diet. I just put the slide in here so y'all would have it. Um, the anti-inflammatory diet based on a diet of fruits and vegetables, getting some whole grains, getting those lean proteins from plant sources and fish, thinking about getting our fat, um, healthy sources of fat that have omega-3 oils in them. I know you guys have other talks on diet today. Um, and in my prevention talk, I'll talk a little bit more about this. But as we sort of make this shift from whole foods into supplements, I think you got to think about this little table. And you guys do this all the time as you think about what interventions you're going to take on, right? I have a high risk of fallopian tube and ovary cancer. I'm thinking about surgery. Surgery has known risks, right? But it also has known benefits. So it would be all the way over there. It'd be a little red category. But we accept those risks because of the known benefits. And then the harder place you start getting into, and people, how many people in this room have, uh, are cancer survivors? Great. And then the other people are um, mutation carriers or families of? Got it. Perfect. Um, so as a survivor, you've already kind of gone through this process of thinking about what are the risks and benefits and then making individual choices. And the trouble in the world of supplements is, is that we don't have the kind of data we like. Now, even in the cancer world, sometimes we don't have that, right? We think about PARP inhibitors and we just don't have the data we want yet to be able to make good decisions about whether or not to use them. And the same is true in this sort of um, supplement and herb world. So I'd love for you guys to also kind of put this away in your heads of thinking about this the same way you might think about an intervention like surgery or like chemo or like anti-hormone therapy. And I'm just going to repeat, if you guys want to come up front and sit in seats, please feel free. I'm not going to be put off. So safety. The quality of herbal pre uh, preparations is not well governed in the United States. The FDA does not regulate what's in a bottle of any given herb. They treat it like food. So food is like a box of cereal, right? And I could put anything I want in a box of cereal, and as long as it didn't kill you quickly, it would be okay. And I could write whatever I want on the outside. I could call it a whole wheat, you know, crunch berry fun, whatever. Um, but actually what I put in there is not measured. 
in Europe, they do this better. The FDA of Germany and a couple of the other countries do regulate supplements and herbs um, as they would regulate other drugs. And so there is more standardization there. Um, that said, um, reported uh, cases of complications are uncommon. There's lots of people who know how to find good um, brands and other good things as you choose supplements and herbs. But you gotta think about, just like medications interact, you're gonna see interactions between the herbs you might be taking and supplements you might be taking and your own medications. Um, things like increased risk of bleeding, interactions with other medications, how quickly they're broken down or not quickly they're broken down, and then cardiac effects. All right, real quick, I'm gonna run through um, an area of controversy that I think is actually still controversial, um, and that is the interactions of supplementary antioxidants with chemotherapy and radiation. As I'm talking about this, I am not talking about antioxidants and fruits and vegetables when you take them as a whole. I do have colleagues who have told their patients not to eat blueberries because they have such a high antioxidant category, you know, and that is wrong, it's wrong, wrong, wrong. In a whole food, we do not think that we see these kinds of interactions that may be concerning. Now that said, we use different forms of very concentrated antioxidants to try to minimize side effects of chemo, so we actually have studies on this. And the vast majority of studies show that antioxidants do not change the efficacy of chemotherapy, and they do seem to d improve the efficacy of the chemotherapy in some settings and alleviate side effects. Um, so 19 randomized control trials. The trouble with these trials were they weren't one cancer site. Lots of the cancers were quite advanced. They weren't perfectly balanced in terms of who got what and what kind of cancers they had. So again, when you do that, you know, benefit risk ratio, you're gonna wanna think about, is this something valuable to you? And think very specifically about what antioxidants you might consider. The radiation world is a little tougher and the, there was evidence that beta carotene could decrease the side effects related to radiation, and indeed it does decrease the side effects. But in smokers, we saw an increase in the likelihood of recurrence, an increase in the chance of death from cancer and other cancers in men who had had neck cancers. And so what I usually say is within radiation, there's probably more evidence that it's bad. Now you guys might say like, I don't need all this data on smokers because I'm not a smoker and so it doesn't really impact on me. And my challenge with that is what about smokers puts them at risk for this interaction with beta carotene both during therapy and as prevention? And it could be a couple things. It could be about smoking itself and the carcinogens that are released and the toxicities that are related to smoking. But it could also be the fact that smoking leads to precancers. And if we're worried about precancers, then suddenly being a BRCA mutation carrier might put you slightly in that same category, right? If you have something that predisposes your cells or one protection factor that's been removed, then maybe you're in. And that's why I think these conversations are really important to all of us. Um, because there might be something about smokers that it's telling us, it's sort of like a warning sign that we all might have a risk for. Um, some uh, small studies that looked at fish oil and their interactions with chemotherapy that made it look like um, there might be some that decreased the effectiveness of chemotherapy, so I tend to keep people off fish oil when they're on chemo, although I'm a big fan of fish oil otherwise. And then again, whole foods, you know, if you are getting three servings of um, seafood a week, you're probably getting your, a good dose of omega-3s and you probably don't even need supplementation. Other little bitty studies looking at symptom management, some benefits of both selenium and zinc for decreasing the side effects of chemotherapy when they were used with chemotherapy. And then there's lots of herbs that are used for some symptoms that weren't my, on my assigned list, so I'm sort of sneaking them in. Um, so anxiety and insomnia, both really common um, issues among people getting cancer treatment. Um, lots of combinations I like, and ultimately you're gonna wanna find a practitioner that you can sort of talk these things out with. Um, 
again, as you choose herbs, there are certain brands that I think are better standardized. There's a company called Nature's Way. There's a company called Gaia, G-A-I-A, -A, um, that are just better quality and more likely to be standardized. And then for anxiety and insomnia, acupuncture, guided imagery, meditation, yoga, social support, all have been shown to decrease those symptoms. All right, another little, I'm like on the off reach of an off reach here, sleep matters. You think about tolerating treatment, we think about getting through things, sleep is really important and it may be important for multiple reasons. There's more and more and more evidence adding up that disrupted circadian rhythms, like mine coming from Arizona to the East Coast, but that, that doing that consistently, night shift work, exposure to light at night, increase the risk of breast cancer, probably ovarian cancer also, probably prostate cancer for men. And we think the pathway that it goes along is melatonin related. That nighttime light is what um, prevents our own brain's melatonin from being turned on. And melatonin's really complicated, kind of like female hormones, in the sense that it's not just a on off, it's at different levels at different times and responses to different things. Um, uh, melatonin may function as an anti-estrogen, um, which may also be beneficial along those pathways. And there's lots of studies in a number of different cancers, but primarily in breast cancer, looking at um, melatonin, seeing some improvements in cancer-related outcome. Some of the other studies didn't show that, and the hard thing is, is people use all kinds of doses of melatonin because it's hard to figure out what the right amount of melatonin is when our brain makes different amounts at different times and they get broken down really quickly. Um, so the good news on melatonin is there's a wide safety profile. So as high as 20 milligrams a day, which is about 20 times a normal physiologic dose, have been shown to be safe in the short term. So who might consider using melatonin? Somebody who's got a hormonally responsive tumor, somebody who's having trouble with sleep. Now melatonin's not gonna put you to sleep like Ambien. The trouble with Ambien and that class of drugs though is that it decreases the depth of your sleep so you don't get your same REM sleep. And that REM sleep is really important for our subconscious to kind of work through things. And so I try to but melatonin will help you, what we call, improve sleep latency, so decrease the amount of time it takes since you hit your head to the pillow to actual fall asleep, but it mostly seems to improve the quality of sleep. Now, as people start increasing their doses, I have noticed one side effect some people will describe, like really vivid dreams, which could be good or bad, depending on the content of your dreams, right? But um, that'll be something to watch out for. I tend to use a sustained release formulation because I think that's more like what our body does, but again, it's um, hard because our body does it in a pretty complicated way. And in the ideal world, you would do some things to try to turn on your natural melatonin. So that means trying to go to sleep at a regular time and get up at a regular time and then thinking about when it gets dark outside, turning down your own lights. Now, none of us is about to sit in the dark, but just turning them down so we start getting that shift in time and then really trying to avoid a TV screen or a computer screen in that hour or so before you actually go to sleep. So those of us who read on Kindles, that's a little bit of a challenge, but it can be overcome. Um, other symptoms, there's things out there for nausea. Acupuncture is great for nausea, and that's the, one of the things that's been um, proven and is uh, sort of clearly supported to do. Um, immune support is a tricky one. It's a really hard thing to study but there are a couple herbs out there that have been studied, um, and one of them is astragalus. Astragalus is a, a herb that comes from traditional Chinese medicine that's in a lot of um, cancer combos that they use. And in a big study where they brought all these patients together, they were lung cancer patients who got platinum chemotherapy, and they saw improvement in survival tumor response and then that performance status thing I was talking about before. I don't think we have a lot of great data on how to improve our perioperative outcomes, but I think that um, making sure you're getting enough vitamin C and zinc, and you don't need huge doses, small doses, about 250 milligrams of C and about 15 to 30 milligrams of zinc a day, making sure you're getting adequate um, weight for protein intake, so it's somewhere between 40 and 80 grams depending on your weight, and you could Google that and find it pretty easily. You want to increase a little bit to that because there's that added stress of surgery. 
walking at least 30 minutes a day, five days a week ideally. And then there's lots of great guided imagery stuff out there that can help decrease pain med use and decrease perioperative anxiety. All right, getting back on track. So practical approaches to symptoms. We're going to talk about cancer-related fatigue and chemo brain first. So people who've had chemotherapy know these things are real. For a long time, we argued that they weren't, and on the medical side of things, we were wrong. Right? People thought it was just because people were stressed because of their cancer or their other treatment and they weren't sleeping well. Turns out that there's direct neurologic and brain effects of chemotherapy. I'm just going to read the definitions. Chemo-related fatigue, distressing, persistent, subjective sense of physical, emotional, cognitive tiredness or exhaustion related to cancer or cancer treatment, not proportional to activities, interferes with usual function. Chemo brain, cognitive changes, um, most often experiences difficulties with concentration, memory, multitasking, planning ability. Sorry, I'm just trying to be cognizant of time since we started a little late. You guys don't have that stuff. So there's certain things that might increase the vulnerability to chemo brain. So we think of that one place where we can intervene. Some of it is a medication and genetic related, so we can't really shift that. But then we think about inflammation, and that's where I think that diet and that stress management thing where we're turning off our natural inflammation might help balance these things, right? And there is evidence that those things can help. We think lots of things feed into this process and are interrelated, and that's why I'm kind of talking about them together. And then there's certain things that aggravate them, like low blood counts, infection, uh, menopausal symptoms, poor nutrition, bad sleep. All of those can make both chemo brain and cancer-related fatigue worse. And then there's this thing called cachexia. And um, again, ladies in the back, if you all want to come up front and take seats, feel free. Um, the cachexia is um, that sort of undescribed thing where people just don't have their appetite, don't feel hungry, or even they're eating and they're continuing to lose weight. We don't totally understand what that's about. We think it might be some interactions of things that are released by the cancers, or it might be that chronic effect of having that really high adrenaline and cortisol that sometimes people who've been going through cancer treatment have because their bodies are kind of in that state of war that doesn't get turned off, and it might be hindering the ability to absorb nutrition. So treat the treatable things. There are some drugs and herbs and other ways to get around it. And then what, what seem like pretty simple brain slash exercises and, and management, stress management techniques can be really helpful. So contributing factors, making sure your anemia, if you're anemic, is treated, dealing with the hormones if you can, making sure you're getting enough oxygen, treating other related things like pain and depression, trying to work on improving your sleep, making sure you're not dehydrated, right? If you erase everything I said and just remember that I said don't be dehydrated, that would probably help all of us, including me. Of course, now I feel thirsty. Um, there are medications out there for chemo-related fatigue and maybe for chemo brain. I have some experience using uh, Ritalin and Provigil. They're tricky, right? Those are actually drugs that turn on your sympathetic nervous system. And it's one of the ways they help because they rev us up. On the other hand, they may not be doing other good things for us. And in that whole, you know, benefit harm thing, Ultimately, you have to try these things, talk them out over with your doctor, and consider them. Kind of why I like using herbs, because they typically don't do that turn on our sympathetic nervous system thing, as long as you're not doing uh, caffeine. In traditional Chinese medicine and in Ayurveda, there's this concept of a, of a herb or a pharmaceutical called an adaptogen. And I think it's really interesting that we, we don't have this concept in Western medicine, the idea that there's herbs out there that can support our body's ability to adapt to stress. Um, astragalus, that one I talked about that may support some immune function and improve for performance status, falls into that category of adaptogen. So do all of these herbs, the ashwagandha, Asian ginseng, rhodiola, American ginseng, and bacopa all fall into that. Also some evidence for <coughs> acupuncture helping with fatigue. So ginseng, one of my favorites, 2,000 milligrams um, were used in this study, where at four weeks you didn't really see a difference, but really interesting, eight weeks, 
substantial improvements in energy level and a 20% improvement on a 100 per, uh, point scale of fatigue. So really dramatic improvements. Exercise is the number one most effective tool we have for chemotherapy related fatigue and chemo brain. And it doesn't make any sense in a way, right? I'm tired, why would doing more stuff help me feel less tired? We don't exactly know, but probably it's that interaction between our hormones. And exercise is a really interesting thing, right? We talked about sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic. You know, wouldn't it make sense that exercise turns on your sympathetic nervous system? Oddly enough, it doesn't. Even in competitive athletes, we don't see the same peaks in cortisol and adrenaline that we do under the stress of driving or the stress of walking in a mall on a Saturday. <laughs> Who thinks that's stressful? I don't, but it is. Um, and so exercise is very interesting. So I actually think exercise has this two for function, right? There's the actual benefit of the exercise, the building our muscles and helping our heart. But then there's that stress management thing, the exercise, when we do it for exercise sake, seems to turn on our parasympathetic nervous system. Um, these are the studies kind of supporting that. Relatively small amounts of exercise, home-based walking, improving walking ability and decreased fatigue. So not like, you know, Lance Armstrong kind of activities. Um, and then these things for chemo brain, you know, brain exercises, having a regular um, schedule, using organization tools like a calendar or a planner, taking breaks, improving your sleep habits. Um, and as we think about cancer-related fatigue, same thing. Several studies use this where they basically just taught people these things. Planning your day, so thinking about when you have the most energy. For some people, it's morning. For some people, it's midday. For some people, it's night. You know, adding short naps, using people to help you do the things that you might want to do. And lots of these studies that had relatively simple coping or strategy or stress management techniques saw improvement in fatigue, improvement in nausea, improved vi uh, vitality, improved mental health, um, and decreased functional impairment. So things that seem kind of common sensey actually having pretty significant benefits. All right, so I timed this to be about this much through our talk, so we're going to just take a minute do a little breathing exercise. Everybody's going to stand up. We're going to put the tip of our tongue behind the uh, upper front teeth like that. We're going to exhale through our mouths and we're going to breathe in through our noses. So we're going to close our mouth and we're going to inhale to a count of four through your nose and then we're going to hold it for seven and then we're going to breathe out for eight. And I'm going to count and you guys are going to breathe. You're going to breathe out. Now breathe in, two, three, four. Hold it, two, three, four, five. And breathe out for eight, three, four, five. What would you like? Breathe it out. Use your tummy muscles when you do that. Breathe out, all right, we're gonna start over. Breathe in, two, three, four. Hold it, two, three, four, five. Breathe it out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Great, everybody can sit down. That's one of my favorite breathing techniques, and I think it works for me because I have to think so hard about it that I can't think about other stuff while I'm doing it. <laughs> um, all right, we're gonna talk a little bit about menopausal symptoms. Oops, sorry, I lied. Chemotherapy-related peripheral neuropathy. And I'm just going to, since we're so limited on our time, I'm going to take a quick poll. How many people in this room think peripheral neuropathy is an important topic? We have some takers. All right, we got it. So lots of the drugs we use um, during uh, treatment and then things like lymph node dissections and other things can contribute to basically dysfunctioning at the, the most distal end of our nerves. And probably all our nerves are getting affected but it's the longest ones that are the slowest to heal. And that's why we see it in the fingertips and the toes the most. And probably chemo brain is sort of a, a, a neighbor or a partner of this kind of dysfunction related to these drugs. Tons and tons of things have been studied to try to prevent it. No real um, uh, great perfect study. They're hard studies to do. In um, diabetes, alpha lipoic acid's been used and there is some um, studies that support that. Effexor has been used. Seems interesting, but it's not 100%. Bunch of herbs. So I use alpha lipoic acid, a 600 milligram dose. That's one of those where you don't have to be that particular about brand because it's kind of hard to screw it up. 
L-glutamine is an amino acid that's really interesting because it's part of healing. It also seems like it's part of maintaining our mucous membranes. Those are the things that lie in our mouth and our GI tract, our lungs, the vagina. And so it actually can sometimes help with mucositis also. And there are about two grams, and it says daily, and it should say twice daily. Um, magnesium, also really important, and it's a trick that chemo does. It gives neuropathy, and it naturally decreases the magnesium because it limits the kidney's ability to hold it. Acupuncture, really interesting, though it's probably more effective for prevention than it is for treatment. But I've had a lot of good luck with even long-standing um, neuropathy that's benefited 10 to 25, 30% improvement. So not gone away completely, but at least let people get off. Things like Neurontin and Gabapentin, some medicines that can have some other side effects. Um, so acupuncture, massage, seems like even stimulating those nerves can improve the healing, so kind of doing that foot massage and hand massage things, and possibly cognitive behavioral therapies. Um, since there were questions, other questions on neuropathy? All right, we'll move right on. Now we're going to get to menopausal symptoms. I'm going to mix it up a little and just talk about both together. The um, majority, almost, of women who are treated for gynecologic and breast cancers um, report some disturbance of their normal sexual functioning. Um, and it's probably related to lots of stuff. The treatment itself, the surgery, how it changes us, our body image, um, worries and fears. Lots of partners feel like their partner is now more fragile. And so that kind of comes into play. Um, and then the actual lack of estrogen that's really common for people uh, who have breast cancer and other hormonally mediated cancers because they're not taking um, treatment anymore, uh, hormone, because they can't take hormone related treatment. So there's also like the combo things, right? All kinds of things impact our own um, uh, libido, our own drive to be sexually active, and our own thoughts about what we look like and how we feel also kind of play into those things. And so things that I talk about when these come up with my patients is one, I try to bring it up because um, it's not always easy to talk about. When we're talking about life and death, it seems like sex is not that important. But if we think about our goal is maintaining the best, uh, the longest, best quality life we can for all of us, cancer patients or not, then um, sexual functioning is obviously a part of that and important. So talking about it. And sometimes it's an easier thing to do with a third person in the room. So having your partner with you when you bring it up with your doctor can somehow ease that whole conversation a little bit. Um, there's real specific things that we can treat, like vaginal dryness is treatable. Sometimes you might be eligible for some low dose um, uh, hormone that just stays in the vaginal area and that can help. There's vaginal moisturizers and lubricants and we'll talk about those some more. And then, you know, it seems like a weird thing to start recommending, like, you know, vibrators and things like that. But if we think about, like, trying to be in a setting where you don't have the same emotional connection to the experience or the fears or anxieties about body image, it can sort of get you to a place where maybe you feel more comfortable that it's going to be okay, because at least it was okay in that setting, right? And at least it was okay putting something in the vagina and it didn't hurt that much and you could use enough lubricant and it was all right. So it can sort of get you over that space. And then there's approaches to improving vaginal flora. Tons of things about chemotherapy, radiation, changes in our diet, change our whole body flora. We don't really have time to talk about that, although it's really interesting. Um, but the vagina specifically, we can see changes, especially with hysterectomies, especially with lack of estrogen. So it seems like the number one way to improve our whole body flora is to have fiber in our diet, to have plenty of fruits and vegetables, and then to think about fermented foods is this really interesting area. So what are fermented foods? Yogurt, kefir, cheeses, pickled things, sauerkraut. Um, some things that are pickled are just soaking in vinegar, but some things are actually changed by bacteria. And you guys can think about the things that actually taste different versus just take like they've soaked. And when you do fermented foods, you want the thing doing the fermenting to still be there. So pickles on the shelf, like non-refrigerated, They've been rinsed out. The bacteria has been rinsed out and replaced with vinegar so it doesn't continue to rot on the shelf. 
But if you get pickles from the deli, where they have that kind of cloudy fluid, then you're getting those active fermenters. And then lots, I mean, most cultures have something, right? Like kimchi, sauerkraut, like um, that tea, kombucha, like lots of those things are fermented. And we think that, that that's part of how we developed anthropologically where we, live, where we didn't have refrigeration, right? But we needed to not die of things. And so those fermented foods kind of let us get through those times. And then Femdophilus is a um, probiotic that has a good amount of lactobacilli. That's probably important. Lubricants, lots of lubricants out there. Um, for some people, the silicone-based ones are going to be better. I am a fan of organic lubricants because that's a mucous membrane, and so it absorbs a lot of things. There's a company called Yes, that's kind of cheesy, Yes, but um, it's, they have water-based ones and oil-based ones, and I actually think you can kind of use your best judgment on what works for you. The oil-based ones are just a little a more emollient, so there's going to be like more of a coating between um, the inside and outside world, and we just think about that friction issue. Those oil-based are going to be better. That said, they're going to be heavier. They can stay in your clothes. Be willing to experiment, but avoid experimenting with things that smell funny or look funny because they may have things in there that are irritating. Um, moisturizers, so the idea of using something in the vagina on a regular basis, especially if you're a runner or a biker doing well, you all are doing that 30 minutes of activity five times a week. So the, that kind of friction can also be an issue in the vagina. So even using just a little bit of a vaginal moisturizer on the outside of the vagina. And some of the lubricants, like the oil-based lubricants, you can use that way too. Um, and then thinking about the concept that there might be a whole team need to be involved, right? Things like pelvic rehab, um, a sex therapist, somebody to talk with you and your spouse to kind of work through the issues can be a whole team. All right, basomotor symptoms, that's the medical word for hot flashes, which also we believed didn't exist for a long time. Now we're like on the page of an intelligent people and understand they exist, but we still don't understand why. And it's kind of interesting. We kind of started figuring out why it might work as we started to figure out medications that seemed to help. So interestingly enough, some of the antidepressants helped. And so we started figuring out that it's probably a centrally mediated thing where our temperature regulation zone is. In the majority of people, it's an estrogen withdrawal phenomena. So it's just that time when you don't have it. And the people it really gets aggravated in are people who have um, tamoxifen or other um, uh, anti-estrogens that are constantly around where they're constantly stimulating new estrogen withdrawal. And then about 20% of women, for some reason, even long after estrogen withdrawal happens and their body should be used to it, continue to have hot flashes. So standard approaches, and I actually really love um, venlafaxine, um, which is a fexor. Some of the other um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac and Celexa also have efficacy. About 30% of people have their hot flashes go away with one of those two things. About 30% of them have it get better, and then about 40% see no benefit. Um, and then there's integrative approaches, so diet, herbs and supplements, acupuncture, mind-body things, guided imagery, hypnosis, sleeping better. Um, one study showed that melatonin at night can help during with nighttime hot flashes. Aromatherapy, lots of different combinations have been used. One of the studies was with lavender. It probably had the best outcomes. And then people who exercise regularly seem to have decreased intensity of their hot flashes. Um, so it brings us to my another area of controversy, soy and phytoestrogens. So phytoestrogens, naturally occurring plant substances that chemically are similar to the most potent form of estrogen, 17-beta-estradiol. But in high concentrations in soybeans, lentils, other um, legumes, and then actually lignans are found in lots of fruits, vegetables, and cereals, lots of herbs, celery, um, because I'm totally blanking, parsley, apples, lots of them will have little bits of lignan in them. Tofu is the main source of soy in Asian diets. In Western diets, it comes from soy additives, which actually might not be good because additives may be processed or um, altered soy um, that were made that way to perform a function in that food that they've been added to that is thicken it or change it or preserve it. And so that probably isn't a good way to get your phytoestrogens. 
So where did all this excitement come from around soy? Lots of data from, again, just like the beta carotene data, epidemiologic data were populations that had soy intake, especially good soy intake during adolescence, dramatically less breast cancer and other hormonally cancer-related um, diseases. And so we started um, looking at them, and what we figured out was that there were these estrogenic properties and structure. And so we thought it was that genistein and diazine, which are the um, main forms in uh, soy products, that they were weak estrogens. So during adolescence, we figured they were taking the spot on different cells of strong estrogen, so they were basically kind of blocking estrogen because they were weak estrogens. So we thought that was great for decreasing the chance of getting cancer, but then we got worried, like, well, we don't want weak estrogens around when people have been diagnosed with a hormone receptor positive cancer, right? No, we don't. So we started studying this. Um, and as we looked at it, what we found was it actually doesn't make sense. And actually, people who have good whole soy intake during their um, cancer treatment and afterwards seem to have improved outcomes. And so what we started figuring out was soy is more complicated and, and hormones are more complicated, right? Tamoxifen, it's a selective estrogen receptor modulator, which means that different estrogen receptors act differently. That's why tamoxifen increases the risk of endometrial cancer because in the uterus, it's a pro-estrogen and it's an anti-estrogen in the breast. It's a pro-estrogen in the bone. So probably that is true that the soy phytoestrogens are also doing the same thing where they're acting a little differently on different receptors. And we just haven't figured out exactly. And so that makes me even more cautious, right, about processed soy and genetically modified soy, that if it's having so complicated an interaction, we don't really want to mess with it. But lots of data adding up. This other study also of 5,000 women where they actually found that the women who had three servings of soy in their diets, whole soy, had improved responses to tamoxifen and decreased rates of cancer returning and decreased rates of cancer-related mortality. So this big study, moderate soy food intake is safe and potentially beneficial for women with breast cancer. Um, this study in, in Caucasian women, so European and American, same thing where the conclusion was we don't have to avoid against whole soy consumption. Um, and then the American Cancer Society finally, years later, agreed. So this is not controversial anymore. Yeah, we wish. Um, regardless, so as we look at dietary approaches, so the data is kind of mixed, but ultimately, um, what might be one of the reasons that we haven't seen the same benefits in um, Caucasian and Western women is that um, some of us don't have the gene that converts soy into its most bioactive form. And the way you get there is you try to concentrate on fermented soy. So fermented soy is like tempeh and miso are the fermented soys and so probably more bioavailable. Um, Flaxseed, also a significant dietary source, we think similar probably acting like a CIRM, that selective estrogen receptor modulator. One study looking at it for hot flashes specifically, seeing a benefit. I feel very comfortable doing these as food sources. I don't encourage people to do powders and pills and capsules and things. Um, what other herbs? Black cohosh, a big one, proved in Europe for the use in hot flashes. This is my favorite go-to herb for hot flashes. Um, after I start someone on Effexor, it is not estrogenic. I repeat, it is not estrogenic. My breast cancer colleagues call me up all the time when I put their patients on this. We work it out. Um, the study was done, and this is this whole issue of like brand names being important. Remifenin, 20 milligrams twice a day. Most people actually need a little bit higher dose than that. Um, and there's different formulations. If you go on the website, you'll find there's actually a nighttime version that has a little bit of valerian in it um, that's kind of nice. Um, it's tricky, though, when you start doing combination of herbs. If you have a side effect, we don't always know what herb it was. So usually I say make sure you do OK with Remy Fenin before you use one of the combo versions of it. Red clover, also interesting, also seem to have some benefit for about 15% of the women who use it. Kava is an interesting um, anxiolytic, so used for anxiety. but. Um, 
We know that some of the menopausal symptoms are about anxiety and mood liability, and that may be why um, affects her and some of the other medications show benefit. So some um, studies showing improvements with kava and St. John's wort, and there's several formulations of St. John's wort combined with the remifenin. Kava, the only tricky part is that's a kava plant there, is um, there was a time in Europe there was a kava shortage and they started using the stems and the roots, and those stems and roots actually have uh, something in them that can be toxic to the liver. So if you're getting kava from a good source, it's only coming from the leaf, and you're not gonna have that liver issue. Um, one last thought on St. John's wort. I don't actually use it a lot. It's very similar in interaction to the whole class of the Prozac Selexa uh, group. Um, and because it's hard to get herbs that are well um, purified and other things, and because of insurance coverage issues and other things, I just tend to go with the pharmaceutical because it acts the same way and I feel like we have more control over dose. But if, if there's someone who prefers to use an herb, I think they're pretty equivalent. And there was a nice study that showed Prozac to be equivalent to St. John's wort for the treatment of mild to moderate depression. Maca, this is an interesting one. So it's a part of the, the uh, Brassica family, I'm probably saying that wrong, is cruciferous. The cruciferous vegetables, right? Cruciferous vegetables are awesome in so many ways. Um, cruciferous vegetables are things like broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts and arugula. For those of you like me who don't like bitter things, arugula you can do. Um, anyway, a couple small studies showing some improvement in sexual um, function and libido in women um, using this as a powder. And then tons of um, evidence adding up that acupuncture um, can help with um, hot flashes, especially the acute ones that happen right away with um, like surgical menopause when we take out the ovaries right, and we see those side effects right away. Um, the tricky thing for acupuncture is it needs to often be like weekly or twice a week and that can really be something that limits people's ability to get it. How am I doing? Um, I'm going to take questions. Uh, the last four slides, and they'll be in the slide set and you'll have access to them online, are just about thinking about how to find a provider. Um, so, you know, when you choose an alternative provider, be as careful about it as you would be about finding a physician. Lots of ways to reach out. Talk to that person about what their training is, about what their experience is. And some things like acupuncture and other things are covered by health plans. And, and ask them all those questions that you would want to ask your doctor. You know, specifically things like, you know, will you work with my healthcare practitioner? You know, what will it cost? Have you taken care of somebody like me with my kind of cancer or my kind of side effects? And, you know, use your own common sense, right? Like, do you feel comfortable with the person? Do you feel comfortable with the office and the staff? And do they support standard therapies? And, and that goes, that's a back and forth street, right? If you're physician is somebody who completely rejects anything outside and that's something that you're interested in pursuing, then that also may not be a good fit for you, right? Same as if you go to an alternative provider who tells you Western medicine is poison and evil, that also may not support you if you're interested in integrating both things into your care.